this series of videos, we're going to look at Blackmagic's Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, or simply the camera, to determine if I can confidently recommend and use it on regular paying jobs, especially when a budget gets tight. Or is this camera simply too good to be true, and will it be the source of client frustration and disappointment? I don't know, so let's just dive in. The first test up is the uh, uber creative uh, let's shoot the clock and see if the camera fails test, uh, which also doubles as a burning test. Now I'm doing this because, you know, it's reported a lot of the smaller cameras, the uh, small mirrorless cameras, they still overheat. I want to know, is this camera going to do that? Um, it's not reported to do that, but you got to run your own test, you got to find out. And again, this also uh, doubles as the burning test. If the camera fails, they usually fail pretty soon after uh, power them on. That's what this is. We're going to fill up a couple of cards and we'll move on to the next test. The camera did fine with the burn-in test. Um, it was in the low 90s, high humidity. We had that midday summer sun just beating on the camera uh, that whole time, but the camera did fine. Next thing we're gonna look at is a comparative rolling shutter test. We're putting up the uh, Pocket 4K mounted up here, as you can see, on top of a C300 Mark II. Uh, the reason is because in Mark IIs, they are known to have a very fast readout for a CMOS camera. Now, on this test, we have three C stands right over here, and I'm just gonna pan across the C stands at different rates of speed to get an idea of that rolling shutter artifact. So let's get to the test. If I take a frame grab from the C300's uh, image at the point of maximum distortion, and then I find the same moment in time with Pocket 4K and overlay that image like we have here, it looks like the Pocket 4K has slightly more rolling shutter distortion at HD resolution and 23.98 frames per second. If we do the same comparison in Ultra HD, we can see very similar results, where the Pocket 4K has just a little bit more rolling shutter distortion than the C300 Mark II. But in my opinion, it's really not that bad, and it's certainly better than many mirrorless cameras. At this time, I do want to mention I will be doing additional tests with this camera, like uh, dynamic range, low light, and audio quality, but uh, there'll be separate videos because otherwise this video will be like way too long and boring, so let's simply move on. The big appeal of this camera, besides of course the price, are the recording codecs, namely ProRes and Blackmagic RAW. And in ProRes, we of course get DCI 4K, Ultra HD, and HD. And of course, with RAW, we get the same resolutions available to us. Now, some clients, they simply want to receive ProRes files. And in the past, you know, with Sony and Canon cameras, I've always had to use uh, an additional uh, recorder monitor to uh, generate ProRes on location. And while we're here, let's just uh, quickly zip through the menu system. Now, uh, as far as I can tell, this is identical or very similar to uh, uh, the Ursa Mini Pros. And that's actually a great thing because I personally, I really like the Ursa Mini's uh, menu system. I think it's one of the best out there. It's very intuitive and easy to use. And it's certainly much easier to use than Sony's or Canon's menu system. So that's definitely a positive. Now my personal favorite feature on this camera is this, the high frame rate button. Now if you look over here, we're at 2398, and if we want to overcrank to 60 frames, we just do this, boom, we hit the button, and now we're at 60 frames per second, just like that. Back to normal, and if we again need to go high speed, boom, hit it again, and then back to normal. Um, now this is just so fast and easy uh, compared to all the other cameras, uh, Sony and Canon, that I really, really like this feature. With batteries, there does seem to be this general complaint with the Pocket 4K about battery life uh, being fairly minimal uh, with these small Canon E6 batteries. Now, personally, I don't have a problem with the small E6 because I view this as a potential uh, backup solution and also as a hot swap solution uh, with this camera. And that's because of, uh, of our workflow. Now, for example, typically, uh, top of the day, cameras will get built, they'll get powered on, and they'll stay on all day long. So naturally, we're going to use, you know, brick batteries like the gold mounts from Anton Bauer or any other brick battery. The camera's going to be built up on rails, and that's just how we work. However, if your workflow is more like this, where it's pretty minimal, you're moving around with the camera, Blackmagic is about to release a battery grip for this camera, as you can see right here. Uh, it says it uses uh, two L-series batteries and can power the camera up for uh, up to two hours. So that looks like a real solution. Having said all that, Blackmagic did give us a pro solution for power right over here. 
a locking two pin connector. Now this connector looks like a cross between a uh, Limo and a uh, Hiroshi uh, connector, but it's something else. I believe they call it a Waifu. So again, it's uh, yet another connector we're going to have to start keeping in our bags. But it just attaches uh, right in here, and we have a solid power connection. Just below, we have a mini XLR uh, mic input or audio input, and this does have phantom power. Uh, so again, a camera of this size and price range to have a, a mini XLR with phantom power is outstanding. Another pro feature is timecode input right up here and a 3.5 millimeter uh, audio input jack. This camera can auto detect uh, linear timecode. We're going to feed timecode via the mini jack and just tap up here. And now the camera is recording timecode in the metadata. Now the Achilles heel to the camera is this HDMI. Uh, I really wish they could have fit a uh, 12G SDI uh, connector to the camera. Um, but I guess, you know, we can't have everything. All right, that just about wraps it up. And as I mentioned before, we will continue on with this series, uh, testing the camera. We're gonna do a uh, practical dynamic range test, low light test. We'll check out the audio quality going directly into camera. And we'll look at some of the popular accessories from lens adapters to cages, and of course, power. Now to answer the question, that was uh, the title of the video, is the Pocket 4K Pro enough? And the short answer, is yes. Um, Blackmagic, they really kind of stack the deck with the specs on this camera. It works, and there's no reason why we can't use it on a variety of productions. But the longer answer is sort of one of those it depends questions. Um, camera's certainly capable. You know, my question is gonna be, is this camera gonna get some uh, blowback from clients, from producers? Are they gonna be like, well, you know, can we use something else? Um, now, I think if Netflix approves the camera, then that'll erase that question mark. I mean, if Netflix approves the camera for their films, then, you know, I don't see why the other producers uh, would not approve the camera for their projects. However, having said that, you know, right now, Netflix, they've only approved the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6. Um, they have not approved the new Ursa Mini Pro G2. Um, to say they just haven't gotten around to it, perhaps they have not gotten around to testing these cameras yet either. Technically, they do seem to match and to conform what Netflix's requirements are, but they're not on the approved list yet. So that's going to be a question that we're just going to have to wait and see. You know, is it pro enough for Netflix? Um, we're going to have to wait and see. Just yesterday, Blackmagic introduced the uh, Pocket 6K camera. And uh, I don't know how you guys felt, but for me, I was like, Oh great, now this camera has just been made obsolete. And uh, you know, I went to bed thinking, well, you know, at least I think I'd still have enough time to return it and just say I wasn't satisfied with the camera and you know, get the 6K. But as of today, I'm having second thoughts on that. And the reason is, I actually think the Pocket 6K and the Pocket 4K are two different animals. On one hand, the Pocket 6K kind of fits into my workflow a little easier right now because it has an EF lens mount. But what makes this camera kind of unique to me is the fact that it has a micro four thirds lens mount and also the uh, crop sensor. So what I mean by that is, you know, Metabones, they just released a whole new series of uh, speed boosters specifically for the Pocket 4K. And what I really like about that are the SIN mounts that are available for the Pocket 4K. I think it's available in PL and also in EF. Now, when you're, you know, working with cameras day in, day out, the difference between a you know, true SIN mount versus the stills twist mount lens mount, um, it actually does make a difference. Uh, I much prefer the uh, SIN mount uh, style lens mounts. Now, the other thing is, we don't know what the sensor is like on the uh, Pocket 6K yet. You know, how equivalent or how much sharper, it does it have better resolution? Does it have better low light capabilities? Better, more dynamic range? Uh, they say on paper it looks very similar. But with the speed boosters, of course, we do get the extra stop or extra stop and a third of illumination, which can make a big difference. Now, we may also get a wider field of view. With uh, one of the speed boosters, I think they, they quoted a 1.3 um, crop factor. Uh, which should be a little bit better than a Super 35 uh, sensor on the uh, Pocket 6K. With the Pocket 4K, I'm really curious about this, a B4 lens mount for the Pocket 4K. Now that'll permit the use of the older HD ENG lenses, especially in the windowed mode, to work with the Pocket 4K. Now I have no idea what, it, what they look like, and that's certainly something I want to take a look at and test, because if you can imagine, again, those, uh, those ENG, those HD specific ENG lenses, 
on the Pocket 4K, especially with a doubler on those lenses. That would be a very interesting and compact and robust unit. Now imagine if you're doing sports or if you're doing uh, events like say a concert and you just need to really just punch in there with a, a long telephoto um, or if you're doing wildlife say and you really need a, a really long telephoto uh, to do your work. If you go with a Super 35 sensor um, you're going to just end up using a huge expensive long telephoto lens or a zoom lens with those ENG lenses, with those HD ENG lenses with the built-in doubler. It could potentially be a compact and easy to travel with uh, camera package. So that's something that I definitely want to test and take a look at. I don't know if it's any good or not again, but you've got to test. Everyone has to do their own test and determine if that's the right fit. So those are my thoughts on Pocket 6K that was just announced. Uh, I do not think it makes the Pocket 4K obsolete. It's just another option. It's just going to be another tool in the toolbox. So is it pro enough? I'm going to say yes. Um, hopefully Netflix will approve these cameras in the not too distant future. But the other thing I have to say is that we got to consider cost. With the cost of the Pocket 4K, you can have backup bodies in your kit and they can stay with you at all times because um, chances are the accessories alone are going to cost more than a body. You know, by the time we get a, a lens adapter, we get a cage, you got to get rails, maybe batteries, small monitor, it's going to end up costing more than $1,300. Catch-22 is as soon as people hear that you have it, they're like, oh great, can we get both cameras running? And then you have to get accessories for both cameras, including lenses. And then you may want to get a third body as backup. And then if they find out you have three bodies, you go, you go down a rabbit hole, which, uh, which actually may be good. Maybe that'll be uh, a reason that you get hired because you do have all these bodies. But that is what this price point brings us. So if this information was helpful, please subscribe and we'll see you on the next one.